Well, Mary, it's so great to have you on the Nothing Is Wasted podcast. Thanks for joining me. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. You know, I, I would love for our um, our community just to hear a little bit about you right now. I know we're going to dive back into some of your story and some of the, um, you know, a couple of the books that you've written. One you've written most recently, Love, Pray, Listen, uh, which I'm really excited about because, man, there's so many of us who are parenting young kids, parenting adult kids. And this, you know, the subtitle of this book is Parenting Your Wayward Adult Kids with Joy. And we've had so many questions in our community of what to do when, you have an adult child who has, you know, either abandoned the family or walked away from the ways of God. And, and so this is going to be a really timely conversation, but I'd love for our, our audience just to hear a little bit about who you are, what you do, where you're at, you know, what your family's like, and then we'll dive back into some of your story and, and the work you're doing. Yeah. So I have a story that's pretty acquainted with grief and having grown up in a home that I didn't want to duplicate. Um, I'm a, a childhood sexual abuse survivor, um, several mm. marriages, uh, not me, but my parents, um, a lot of neglect, drug abuse, just every bad thing that can happen to a child in a home, abandonment, wow. all that uh, happened to me. And um, I didn't know Jesus growing up. Um, I eventually, through my desperation and my sadness, I met him through the ministry of Young Life when I was a, a teenager. Oh, cool. And yeah. um, thankfully, just I, I wish I could say, well, then I met Jesus and then I was healed. But <laughs> and everything changed, right? Isn't that how it <laughs> normally goes? Like no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the Lord spends several years getting Egypt out of us, doesn't he? Yeah. So the rest of my life has just been this healing journey of mm. learning to deal with trauma and the aftermath of that. And a lot of the ministry that I do is for people who are healing from past injury. And um, mm. this book that I've written is my 46th book. So uh, I've been around 46? a bit. 46? The... <laughs> oh my gosh. That's amazing. Wow. Wow. Yeah, I'm a little bit crazy. I've written a lot of books. I make the, uh, I've said before that um, every book that I write, God uses to heal me. And so the joke is I had a lot of healing to do. So I had to write all these books. <laughs> oh, man. But you know, I that's, am, that's, uh, go ahead. Mary, I'd love for you to, I'd, I'd love for you to unpack that a little bit. Cause I think, I mean, you're saying that in jest a little bit, but I think there's a profound truth behind that, that every book that you've written, God's used to heal you. Can you take a moment and just explain what you mean by that? Well, I believe that God uses our unique capabilities and the giftings that he's given us as a means to heal us. And so as mm. a communicator, when I share my story, there's a bit of healing that happens. And when I write uh, things down, there's healing that happens. It's my unique way that God has gifted me and he uses that unique way to bring healing. So if you're an artist, um, let's hmm. say you're a watercolor artist, he can use your art to bring healing to you, which is a really beautiful thing about the Lord. He, his journey for you in healing is going to be shaped like you. Wow. Mary, that's huge. Okay. Let me tell you why that's really big. Cause I was, I was uh, on a podcast yesterday with a, what, you know, I'm a pastor. So to, in, in, in some respects, I'm an itinerant pastor. And so I was on a podcast with a, a network that serves pastors and they were asking me about my story. And in 2016, after my wife was, um, was murdered, I still preached 35 Sundays that following year. So like months after 35 Sundays in the church, I was pastoring and he was like, that is crazy. And I've always felt really almost bad about articulating that because I'm like, well, that's probably not what I would advise anybody else to do. But for me, it was the right thing to do because it aided in my healing. And I've never thought of it in those terms until you just said that, that it was actually, well, this is how God wired me. He wired me to communicate and to preach. And so of course he's going to use that and leverage that giftings, you know, to, to, to shape my healing. That is, that's amazing. I don't know if anybody else is feeling this like aha moment, but you're counseling me right now, Mary. Thank you so much for sharing that. That's all. That's incredible. Incredible. Okay. Continue. I'm sorry. I'd cut you off and we went on a rabbit trail, but I'd love for you to keep going. You know, that's a great rapid rabbit trail. And, um, because the healing journey is so different and unique and beautiful and powerful. And I, I run into people all the time who, 
especially sexual abuse survivors who say, how long is this going to take? It's taking mm. so long. But um, I can honestly say that every year is more beautiful. And if you can just mm. persevere through some of those darker moments, there are those lights at the end of the tunnel um, as you do so. And the light tends to be God placing you in other people's lives to bring healing to them because there's such mm. a, and that's probably why you're doing this podcast. There is yep. such a profound solace and, you know, shalom, this wholehearted shalom that God gives when you get to be a part of someone else's healing story. Wow. Wow. That's so true. That is so true. And that's one of the things we're telling people all the time is, you know, we, we, we say, Hey, redemption is not when God like restores back to you what you've lost. Redemption is when you turn your pain around to help other people. That's when mm -hmm. redemption begins. And in the process of that, God is healing you while you're doing that. It's amazing. Yeah, it's, I'm, I'm so grateful. And you know, this, I wouldn't trade my story for anything. And Really, the story that mm. I just shared, which was really truncated, had a lot to do with my fear as a parent. So we learn how to parent mm. by what we experienced. And so yeah. my fallback was not, there was no example there. And so wow. I had to, you know, I thought that parenting would be really hard throughout all those younger years and, you know, elementary, yeah. high school, and they were hard because I had to, my parenting strategy was cry a lot and get on my knees because <laughs> I just didn't wow. know what to do. I didn't have any prescribed method. I didn't, right. my fallback was abandonment. And so I had to like constantly coach myself and watch other parents that were doing it well, read a lot of books, Wow! but nobody prepared me and I'm finding this for all Christ followers. No one prepares you for the parental role of your 20 somethings or your 30 somethings. Mm. I, like most parents, I kind of had this, you know, romantic idea that if I obeyed all those books that I read, and I even wrote a couple parenting books, but, mm. um, if I obeyed them, then like this beautiful machine, if I pulled all the right levers, when they came out on the other side, right. they were going to be, you know, proverbed <laughs> so that yep. I'm going to train up yep. a child in the way he should train go. Up a child in the way he should go. Old, That's exactly what I was thinking about. Wow. From it. And I wow. found that that formula wasn't true. And mm. so then um, I have had to kind of work through that. And that's why I wrote this book. Wow. You're telling me that human beings can't be uh, machin machinized, right? <laughs> we can't like <laughs> just make them mechanical, you know, and w input A, B and out pop C. And, and you know, but what's I, I say that jokingly, but it, the reality is, is that's often the trap that we fall into, especially when it comes to parenting. And then it's the lie on the back end. The enemy gets us to believe when we have experienced what what you know one of the, what you're talking about with with uh, a, a child in their adult years who has decided you know I'm I'm not going to follow after God's ways even though you've spent so much time trying to cultivate an environment where they're going to fall in love with Jesus and they're going to fall in love with Jesus's ways and follow after Him for the rest of their lives it doesn't always happen that way. No, and that's where we have to go back to theology in the Garden of Eden mm -hmm. and realize that. In a perfect environment with a perfect parent, God had wayward adult kids <laughs> and wow. so bad and such a terrible scale that we're all messed up because of it. And so wow. if we can rest in that and realize that we have this great empathetic savior whom the entire human race has rebelled against billions of people, he understands what it is like to have an adult child stray. And, and mm. that's where I've gotten so much solace. And my relationship with Jesus, Jesus has had this opportunity to deepen because we have this kind of camaraderie going on yeah. and he can pour into me in that, in the midst of that parental grief. Mm. Mm. You, you know, I think it's like, I think it's really, it, it feels so cathartic to even hear, um, Hey, God had wayward adult kids in 
perfection, right? So there's really no <laughs> perfect environment that we can create. I mean, it almost releases the pressure valve a little bit. I've got three younger kids, right? Nine, eight, and two and a half. And so we're just in crazy years right now, but it's at the very beginning stages of starting to figure out how, you know, to move from just keeping them alive to now shepherding their heart, right? Our nine and our eight year old, it's like, we're having tons of conversations, lots of like disciplinary trying to train, trying to, you know, and so it's exhausting. And I tend to slip into that same formula of going, well, if we do the right things here, they're going to pop out on the other side of this really uh, great. And there's so much frustration there and I can take on, and my wife and I, we can take on that stress and that frustration of really almost buying into this, you know, this belief or this lie that there's something wrong with us or the way that we're parenting. If we're not seeing output C, like what we thought is supposed to happen right here. Um, how, how do you, you know, it, it feels so good to hear that. Wow. God had adult wayward kid, but I, I, yet I still struggle with some of those emotions. And I know people were listening to this who have wayward adult kids. They, they struggle with the emotions of going, yeah, but I still feel like if I had done some things differently, I have some regrets. I, you know, there's some things that I'm not proud of. I'm ashamed of, and, and, and maybe it would have turned out differently. How do we begin to kind of untangle some of that? Cause that's trauma in and of itself. It is. And this, the structure of the book goes through the love is and love is nots from first Corinthians 13. And I unpack, you know, the nuances of the Greek and all of that. And so mm. I'm basically sharing what love is and what it looks like. And when we look back on our parenting, I think 100% of us will have regrets um, because we don't do things perfectly, obviously. Mm. And hopefully this is something for parents of kids of any age. We have learned the art of humility, which is to say, I'm so sorry. I lost my temper. Will you mm. forgive me? And to model that for your kids. And I used to kind of be surprised when my kids would say those exact same words to each other when they hurt each other's feelings. Well, they had mm. seen it modeled by their parents. And you still have that opportunity as a parent of an adult child. If you, if you look back and you think, ah, I was really judgy or harsh or, um, you know, maybe I shouldn't have disciplined this way or whatever. We all have regrets. And that's not too late to say, you know, I really regret that. And I'm really sorry. And if I was going to do it over again, I wouldn't have talk to you that way. Will you please mm. forgive me? There is always a chance to bring reconciliation, at least on, as far as it depends on you to apologize yeah. for what you can apologize for. But the other end of that is the love is, is also for us as parents, we can live in this knotted reality of thinking we never do anything right. And to begin to offer the same kind of love and grace that God offers our adult children and our children and our mm. families to ourselves and to be able to grace ourselves. Because if we live in that condemnation, we're going to be parenting scared. But yeah. if we live from this wholeness of, yeah, of course, I'm a sinner. Of course, I make mistakes. But thankfully, his grace is sufficient for me from mm. his power is made perfect in my weakness. And we always think, oh, well, I have to be perfect for God's power to be made manifest. But actually, it's the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> we have to be weak to experience yeah. his power. Wow. Wow. You know, as uh, something you said earlier, and I'm going to kind of like dive back and we'll we'll come back to this place. But I'm really curious because you said that there was so much of your experience as a child in sexual abuse. Uh, growing up in the household that you did that really um, that informed a lot of your fear during parenting years mm -hmm. because you didn't have a model for that. You, you didn't have any kind of, and, and that's, this is such an intriguing topic to me um, very personally because my, my wife now she's shared very publicly on our podcast and, and with people just about her childhood, her upbringing and, you know, abandonment from a father and how she, she shares with me now, um, you know, it's really difficult to override some of those, you know, we recognize it a lot of times it's like generational sin mm -hmm. cycles, right? Generational curses. But, but she also has articulated that idea of like, I'm, I'm having to override what I saw modeled to me in the negative aspects growing up as a child every single day when it comes to parenting decisions. And I grew up in an extremely 
loving, you know, affirming household. My dad's a pastor. My mom's a teacher, wonderful people, just like love the Lord. And so for me, some of those things come natural, just kind of like, you know, being, you know, sitting with my kids, affirming them, like praising, you know, that just some of those. And, and for her, it doesn't come as natural. And so she can tend to be very exhausted, you know, and she shared this, like I can get so exhausted trying to every day override some of those things. I wonder if you were like sitting down to have, to have coffee with her or let's expand this because so many who are listening to this are experiencing the same things, right? They've experienced childhood trauma. They're trying to figure out how to, how do I be the generation that puts a stake in the ground and, and changes my family tree so that my kids don't have to experience the same thing that I did, the same kind of environment and household that I did? If you're sitting down having coffee with them, what would you say? I mean, you, you, you know, what kind of, I, I, I hate to sound trite and say advice, but like, how would you counsel them in that when they're like, it just wears me out all the time trying to override what I've been wired to respond with? I would say that it eventually works. And so I'll give you an example because of the way I was raised when a child came to me with like an owie, you know, they had like mm -hmm. a little bit of blood on their arm and I, my immediate reaction was to dismiss it and just be mm. like, you're fine. You're fine. And because I, I had to be fine. I, my limb could be severed and I'd have to stitch yeah. it back on, you know, so I'm like, you're fine. And so I had to coach myself. I taught myself, I said, okay, Mary, you have to empathize with them. You need to hug mm. them and get a band aid and nurture them. And it was like rote. It was like training mm. myself to do something alien. And eventually through all those patterns of just repetition, I eventually became that empathetic mom. The other thing that mm. I would say though, in, in, in just trying to help people in that situation. And this is not easy to do, but to find someone to reparent you, to find a mentor, mm. someone older than you who can walk you through that valley. Um, when I was a young mom, there was a lady in my neighborhood who actually went to my church and we would take these, she was probably 20 years older than me. And we would take these long walks. I put my kids in the stroller and I would just ask her questions and she would just flat out mm. love me. And I still go back to that time. We need to be reparented, reloved, reshown. Wow. We need to have mentors in our life who answer those questions. Wow, that's uh, uh, you know that's an unbelievable piece of advice right there. Something that hadn't really occurred to me that even in our adulthood, you know, we still need that those parenting figures, and that you know we talk about this quite a bit on the podcast that. Um, and an emotionally laden trauma needs emotionally laden experiences to rewire or to heal. And the Holy Spirit's so gracious in providing us those emotionally laden experiences with him, the personal presence of the Holy Spirit, encounters that we have with the Holy Spirit. Maybe, you know, even if it's just in our room, listening to worship music or at a, at, at a church service or wherever it might be, right? He's not confined to any kind of environmental conditions, but he often uses other people, right? The body of Christ, mm -hmm to bring those emotionally laden experiences that trip, they trip the wiring in our, you know, in our, in our brain to go, no, that's not okay. I've been believing this false thing because of my experiences in my past. And this person is showing me the truth and the reality of, of, you know, God is my father and um, nurturing nature of him. And yeah, that's great. That's wonderful. So, I actually have a little know, story about that. Yeah, if please, you do. Hear it. please do. Please yeah. do. So what I've learned is, and just exactly what you said, is that a relational wound requires a relational cure. And what wounds mm. us is what heals us. And mm. so when my husband and I and our kids, when they were younger, we were church planters in the south of France. And every bad thing that could ever happen happened to us um, on wow. an extreme scale, so much so that... Um, one of my husband's professors from Dallas Seminary said, I've never heard a story like that. And we were so grateful to hear that because we thought it was wow. extreme. But anyway, we flew home when we were done with our assignment there. And I remember thinking to myself, I will never trust another Christian leader again. I'm so wounded. I'm just going to retreat into my shell. And I am especially mm -hmm. wounded by Christian leaders. So we get right. home and to Dallas and 
Um, we're going to live, it's, it's Christmas time. We're going to live in the corner of a barn, which is weird because my name's Mary. And so here we are living in a barn <laughs> at Christmas and we get to the barn and it's a little, there's a little apartment. We're not living in the hay, but there's a little apartment in the corner of the barn. And there are, I didn't even think we we're going to have Christmas because we were so destitute and so in pain. Someone mm. had put up Christmas lights. Our church had put a Christmas tree up. There were presents, there were, um, the pantry was stocked. And in that moment, when we walked in and our friends were there, the Lord was very clear to me. He said, are you going to trust me in relationships again? And Mm. it was fits and starts, but those friends, they loved me back to health. And I learned that truth that a relational wound requires that relational cure. Had I pushed against the community and body of Christ, I would probably not be here today in terms of, I would still be bitter. I would still be angry. I may have walked away from the faith. I don't know, but um, I needed the body of Christ in that time to be able to heal that wound. Wow. Wow. That's powerful, man. Can you think too, Mary, of some other, maybe anecdotally or just some profound moments for you um, that, you know, this, this, uh, the sexual abuse that you experienced as a child that, you know, where were some of these breakthrough moments that God met you to begin healing you, um, you know, after, after you were out of that environment as you're following after him and you're trying to untangle some of this trauma that you experienced, because it sounds like it was in the midst of also the pressure of ministry, the pressure of parenting, the pressure, I mean, it's the life that all of us are living as we're trying to untangle and heal from trauma in our own lives. And it'd be one thing if we could get away, you know, for several months of a sabbatical and just kind of spend time with God and let him heal us. But the reality is, is we're going about life and doing all of these things while we're trying to heal. Can you, can you think of some big moments that, you know, some of those things were true relational uh, interactions healed you or emotional moments that healed you? Like I said before, as a communicator, when I met Jesus, it was like I was 15 and a half years old and it was like these floodgates came out and I became an oversharer. But I Mm. think part of that healed and saved me because I began to trust my young life leaders and then I would go to church by myself and trust my leaders there. And I just started sharing my story. And I often tell audiences that an untold story never heals. So if Mm. you do have an untold story, it's time to find someone excessively safe safe. I was lucky to have found those people. Actually, the first time I told the story, I told it to an unsafe person who did not believe me. And I had to retell the story over and over again to force them to understand that it actually happened. But after that, I had some people listen. And then I would say, of course, um, I just, I cried and prayed a lot. And the lion's share of my healing came in college where I had these praying friends Um, who just would listen to my story, cry with me and lay hands on me and pray for me Mm. for four years. And so much so that when I was in my thirties getting counseling, because we finally could afford it, my husband was going to seminary and they gave anybody in the family free counseling if they needed it. We're like, finally. So I go to this counselor (laughs) because we're poor and Uh. um, I tell her my story. And the first thing she says to me is how many years of counseling have you had? And I, I, honestly said no. Mm. And she said, Oh, that's a funny joke. Ha ha ha. And I said, no, literally I've had none. And she said, it doesn't make any sense how you can be okay. And, and I thought about that a long time. And I think it was those four years of prayer that really profoundly, and not to say I didn't need the counseling. I did that too, but, um, that was really profound for me. The Nothing Is Wasted content library of resources and podcast episodes are made possible by our growing community of members. If you would like to be a part of having a global impact and help people partner with God to take back their stories, consider joining Community Plus for just $20 a month. Your membership comes with access to a course called Position for Redemption, master classes taught by our certified coaches, bonus podcast episodes, and Q&As with myself and some of our other special guests. You can get more information and sign up at nothingiswasted.com slash community. I look forward to connecting with you further within our Community Plus platform. That's huge because, no, yeah, you're right. Like, not to say that you didn't need counseling, but there, uh, you know, 
there are some things that uh, th- that gave you a leg up on the counseling, right? Mm-hmm. That gave you an, an advantage that a lot of folks don't have if they're going to see counseling. And that's the first type of work that they've done. But the Lord was gracious to bring you into these spaces where you could do some of this prep work to where even your counselors looking at you going, come on, you've had, you've got to have had more counseling than that, than just that this isn't your first time. Right. But how profound is it that I'm not saying, I'm certainly not saying counseling is not necessary. Right. But I'm also, I'm also saying the Lord is powerful in right. his, when we surrender to his healing plan, he's extremely powerful. I, I had a similar experience too. And you're, I feel like you're bringing a lot of, you're shining a lot of light on my own story right now, as we're talking about this, Mary, you know, because when I sat and did some intense counseling several months after my wife was killed, my counselor was like, you know, you're, you're doing pretty good. Like, and I'm like, no, I can't be doing good. Like, I don't know what you mean, you know, but I'm, as I'm like processing it out loud to him and stuff, he's like, you're, I, I like the track that you're on. You're, you're processing through this the right way. You're seeing things the, in, a, in the proper perspective. And, and I now, as you're explaining this, can attribute it to all of those times I was forced, whether by, by preaching or, or leading, you know, a staff or whatever to communicate what I was feeling and what I was going through. It's very important to let out what's inside and, um, it's profound. And, hmm. and that's why, again, we need each other and we need the body of Christ and why God has, a, even in the community of the family, we, yeah. we need each other. God places us in all these, you know, like oikos these little communities right. of, of fellowship and love and our family is that little community too. And, and these are supposed to be the safest places. Now, sadly, mm. Um, there's plenty of stories out there of churches that have been unsafe or families that yeah. have been unsafe and we have to work through that. But, um, but when it works right, <laughs> it can be profoundly healing for the wow. Christ follower. Wow. Well, and so your experience in college with prayer really informed a lot of then kind of what you would champion and what you would be doing for, you know, the foreseeable future. Can you talk about, that talk about the the just how profound prayer uh was for you but also like how how important it is in terms of our you know not just not just our walk with the lord but in terms of our own healing in terms of working through a lot of grief and and trauma in our own lives i i was um my husband was in seminary when i heard I don't know why it took me so long to hear about this, but I heard about lament Psalms Mm. and um, it really profoundly affected me. In fact, I talk about it even in the most recent book I wrote is the importance of prayer slash lament. And there are um, a large majority of Psalms are lament Psalms and they have a specific way of walking through them. And it starts Mm. with why God, why, (laughs) why Mm. is this happening? And it ends with, you work through the process of it. And David did it all the time in the Psalms. You know, why yep. does this happen? Why are the evil people prevailing? Why, why, why? But I will trust mm. in your unfailing love. But you own the cattle on a thousand hills. But, mm-hmm. and I'm going to choose to praise you in the midst. And so that kind of prayer has been really profound for me in working through all sorts of different difficulties in my life. Mm. It is normal and okay. God's shoulders are big enough to hold your whys. That's I right. used to feel earlier that, you know, I, oh, you can't say that to God. <laughs> you, know, mm. he, he, you can't complain to him about how he's working too slowly um, mm. because it's in the Bible and we can. Right. And so I think right. that's kind of the pattern of prayer that has really helped me of late. Yeah. Yeah. If God didn't want that to be part of our uh, language with him, then he would have struck it out of the Bible. Right. Mm-hmm. He would have said, nope, we're not putting in a pattern or example of this inside of, no, you he, he, intentionally left it in there in the canonization of scripture. And I believe not just, not just like left it in there, but wants to point to it and say, this is actually how you approach me initially when it comes to grief. This is how you wrestle with me. This is how we grapple through this so I can bring healing to it. Cause a lot of people take those questions and they use those questions as reason to run away from God mm-hmm. and God's going, no, I want you to bring me those questions. And, and that's where we're, you're going to meet me. You're going to find me in this, in this pain. Yeah, so true. And, and in 
that my my book just released this week, so I've get, I'm getting all sorts of congratulations. Comments. That's <laughs> awesome. You. Your Thank forty you. you know thousandth book that you've released. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> old hat, right? Um, <laughs> but I'm getting comments from people, and I'm getting um, I've already it just released yesterday, day before yesterday, and okay. I got a an email today from someone who sent the book to their mom who has an adult child. So another adult child, yeah. um, who's just in grief stricken by it. And they are having that experience of realizing, first of all, they're not alone. And I think that's one of the mm. problems that we're experiencing in this perfect church that we live in. We want to mm. all be perfect and have everything together. So we don't talk about our kids that are doing things that we don't like. Um, yeah. But she finally felt like she was no longer alone in that story. Mm. And I think that's why what is profound about the gift of writing is that we write so that others don't feel alone. So they don't feel like, you know, no one else is walking through this. Mm. Mm. Man. So how important is prayer, maybe particularly praying Psalms of Lament or or other mm. types of prayer, how how is that uh, how important is that in in relation to this um dilemma that we can find ourselves in as parents where we have kids that are whatever the continuum is just you know not obeying or have completely walked away from the lord how how important is prayer in all that process you know the the book is called love pray listen because those are as our kids leave the nest it's really all we can do we can't mm. love pray manipulate love pray control <laughs> you know we can't yeah. do any of those things so we can love we can pray we can listen and to pray is um is to surrender the situation mm. to the god that loves your kids more than you do and i mm. and i i know that's true it's hard for man, me man you got to you got to say that again you got to say that again mary <laughs> cuz that's i mean we can't just gloss over that that's <laughs> profound truth right there but that's something we don't like to not that we don't like to we just don't believe it sometimes no and it's it's hard because of our connection to our children is so profound that we can't imagine that god loves them more than we love them but he absolutely <laughs> does he created them yeah. and so I have found that um, surrendering them and surrendering their journeys has been such a great practice. And there's freedom that comes. I no longer have to be the puppet master pulling the strings mm. and I can let God be God in that situation. And it doesn't mean that I'm not going to grieve. It doesn't mean that things that my adult children, whether they're wayward or not, I've got, you know, a whole spectrum of kids doing all sorts of things. Mm. In fact, this is a book for parents of adult kids mainly. It's not just wayward. It's just yeah. kids are going to make all sorts of decisions when they're outside of your house and you yeah. don't have control. So <laughs> what do you do? You hit your knees and you say, I mm. surrender to the one who loves them more than I do. Mm. Mm. Man, this is both convicting and inspiring because <laughs> prayer, prayer for me you know, I'm a doer, right? I'm like, okay, what can I do, God? What can I do? Tell me what I can do and I'll go do it, right? Give me an assignment. I'll make it happen. Let's go. And and so prayer for me tends to be a last resort rather than a first response. And, you know, as believers, it should be the very first thing that we go to, right? From the from the moment our, we, we find out about conception of our kids, right? From the moment they are conceived to the moment that, you know, we die or whatever, right? That the entire, we should be praying for our kids. We should be praying for so much, but it's a matter of trusting, actually trusting God to do the things that we can't do. And we I find myself so often just in this frenetic activity of trying to figure out what's the latest tip, the latest trick, the latest parenting hack, the latest life hack in general that I can implement into my life to make things a lot more efficient and productive. And, and God's like, let me just, let me be your productivity uh, hack. Let me be the one that like takes care of this for you. Trust me in this. This is not a battle you have to fight. You need only be still and wait on me and trust in me. That is so difficult for us, especially in Western American culture, when we are caught up in this frenzy of activity and this busyness all the time, and we're inoculated with so much information about here's what you should do. Here's what you should do. Here's what you could do. Here's what you can do. And man, you're, this is convicting Mary. This is convicting. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, oh, I hear you. I mean, it's, and I want to, I don't want to come across as someone who's got it all together. I, like I said, it's just this parenting was a sanctification journey for me and parenting adult kids is a sanctification journey for me. There have been moments where I have, I literally have fallen on the floor and I, I couldn't get any lower. I needed to be as low as mm-hmm. I needed to be with tears wetting the hardwoods <laughs> and just saying, I, I can't, Lord, you can help. That's a really simple prayer. I can't, you can help. And, mm. um, and to be, become more of an intercessor, uh, to intercede for those people mm. in my life that I love so, so much. Wow. And, um, and I don't want to gloss over to the, the, the heartache that comes to parents of adult kids, particularly yeah. ones who have ghosted them and have walked completely mm. away from them. Literally the only thing you can do is to pray and, and to trust. And that is a hard place to be, but I yeah. want you to understand that you are in solidarity with the father in the prodigal son's story. Mm. Remember what he did his child basically says, I want you dead. Give me all your money. Mm. And he did not chase after the child on their journey. Now he waited on tiptoes and stood on the hill and mm. put, you know, he was putting his glasses on and yep. looking. He waited, yep. but he did not participate in what the prodigal son had done. He did not chase mm. after him or try to micromanage. He waited until the son came back. And so mm. you have a friend in the father who understands waiting on tiptoes. Wow. Wow. Do you have any moments that you can point to where you specifically were praying for something or for someone, maybe one of your kids and, and you saw the Lord move in that direction in that person's life and you didn't have to say a thing, right? You, the Holy spirit just did his thing. Yes. So many times, so many ways. And, you know, I think in the today, um, a lot of parents, whether they have young kids or teens or, you know, kids out of the house, they're dealing with all sorts of things that we didn't have to deal with when we were kids. Right. Mm -hmm. So we've got gender identity issues. We've got a mental health crisis and all Mm -hmm. of that that's going on. Yeah. And so we need Jesus more than ever because we don't even know how to navigate that. And so I can even see in um, one particular, one of my kids, um, the Lord was really gracious to me and gave me kind of a vision of what, how that path was going to lay out. And so I've just been praying behind the scenes and inevitably that meant a blow up was going to happen. Something bad was going to mm. drop into their life. And I, and I sensed it cause God prepared me for it, but I'm beginning to see that in that implosion or that explosion, God is doing some profound work and he had prepared mm. me for it in prayer. And so hang in there, mama <laughs> and hang in there, yeah. dad. Um, yeah. ha- and I guess that's, maybe that's my point is that, this whole thing is about, um, it's about our discipleship journey mm. and the closer you are to Jesus Christ in that journey, the more you fall in love with him, the mm. more he shares his secrets with you, the more you have this like moment by moment conversation with him that leads mm. you through some of the valleys of the shadow of death. And so it doesn't matter if you're a parent of adult kid, parent of a little kid, no parent at all that your job is to finish well on this earth and to keep going on the discipleship journey. Mm. The thing that I've seen most about parents of adult kids is we've got kids out of the house and we are actually in our most fruitful years of ministry. And what I have seen is that the enemy of our souls has attacked our adult kids and Mm. taken them down, but he has a second victory because it immobilizes us from doing the ministry God has right. for us. Right. So please don't let the enemy have a second victory. Get on your knees, say, That's Lord, good. I want to be used right now, and I'm going to keep going in this fruitful ministry. Not that I won't grieve, not that I won't be sad, mm. but I'm going to keep going and persevering because I'm not going to let the enemy have a second victory. Mm. Mm. Do you think this is so difficult, Mary, because of our propensity to tether our identity, our own personal identity in our kids? 
Oh, yes, of course. And I think in our um, kind of family centric American Christianity, like we're, yeah. we, I feel bad for singles in American Christianity because they get oh, yeah. pretty marginalized. Right. And like right. the upper echelon is you're a mom and a dad and you've got kids. And then that's the whole yep. thing. And so we've deified or idolized this particular structure. Um, mm. And therefore, uh, if I want to be cool in my church, I'm going to have these great, perfectly behaved children, and wow. they are going to be, in kind of some weird narcissistic way, they're going to be a reflection of who I am. Wow. And um, let me just tell you, folks, <laughs> that's a very dangerous way to live because Man. 100% of your kids are going to do crazy things, and they're going dis- to disappoint you, and they're going to be out in the community when they do it. And so if your wow. identity is tied to their behavior, you're on a slippery slope of identity. Wow. Man, that is so that's huge right there. That's so big. The older my kids get, the more I see that temptation, you know? Mm-hmm. That and and what's what's so crazy, you know, um my mom used to tell me when I'd go some somewhere, like I'd go to a friend's house, "Hey, remember who you are and who you represent." Mm-hmm. And she, I, I believe at some point she, you know, explicitly defined that as like, you represent Jesus, right? But you also represent this family. And so she didn't mean anything, you know, like she, she meant everything good about it, right? Like, mm-hmm. hey, we're a family, we rep- we're Blackburns. Is it? But I see that like, that can almost can, can be contorted or distorted into, um, it's not her fault, but it's, you know, uh, I see that in my own where I'm like, you know, talking to my kids, you're representing Blackburns. Blackburns don't do that, right? And it's like this, I begin to feel this pride over this is our family and this is how we're going to show up in the world and this is how we're going to, you know, and I'm like, wow, that's, and and now when I see my kids do it, I can see the unraveling of that, of going, wait, they're not, you're not making me proud of you right now. What's wrong? (laughs) And, And it seems so just, just icky, right? But it is, it's, it's where we tend to, that's the line, the, the side of the line we tend to fall on in American Christianity, especially it's like just what you said. We want to have this pretense of perfection as a family. And that is probably, that is certainly not aiding in some of these scenarios of having a, a, a child that goes wayward or that ghosts you because now, now we don't want to talk about that. We don't want those kinds of things to be, you know, exposed. We don't want anybody to know about that. And so now we're just silently dealing with that in desperation uh, and, and, and in isolation. Yeah. And that's really why I wrote the book. And weirdly, it wasn't my own experience that was the impetus for the book. It was that I was in this prayer loop with a group of people and there was a lady on the prayer loop who whose adult kids had strayed. And it had ruined her life. She had envisioned, mm. you know, ha- growing up and having her kids live nearby and the grandkids and, and always family dinners and, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas and none of it came true. And the opposite came true. And anytime she'd have a birthday or a celebration when they weren't there, it devastated her and it, it mm. was profoundly sad. But what I, as I was watching her, I realized that her identity was deeply tied to what they would do and how they would turn out. And her expectation was that everything would turn out in the way that she wanted it to. Mm. Now we're all dealing with human beings and our expectations have to be held very loosely because they will be shattered in this life. Mm. And the question becomes, what do you do when everything that you wanted to happen falls by the wayside or shatters in front of you? Can you still have joy? That's why it's the last name, last part of the book, Mm. parenting your wayward adult kids with joy, because there is Mm. still joy to be had. Um, Everything can fall down around you. Everything that you, all your fears can come true. Uh, Job said, everything that I feared has come upon me. So he experienced it as well. All my terrible fears have happened. And yet, Mm. um, even though the fig tree doesn't blossom, I'm wow. still going to be okay because the God of the universe gives me that security. He is the wow. one that provides my identity and he will not leave me or forsake me. I can have good expectations of God. Um, he's not going to disappoint me. Mm, that's so good. That's so good. 
Wow. So if you're talking to parents of, of young kids right now, um, you know, obviously we have established there's nothing really formulaic about your kids being able to turn out a certain way. But um, you know, how would you how would you counsel me, for instance, when it comes to um, creating a climate for our family, when it comes to prayer over our kids? You know, what does that look like? Because I, I certainly don't want to leave a, an impression by any means of like, well, you know, it's kind of futile. What you, whatever you do right now, it doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> kids are going to go one way or the other, right? It, that's not what we're saying. And, but we're also at the same time, not saying that you can manipulate your kids into following after Jesus as well. Right. So how do I find that, that right tension point as I'm parenting young kids, you know, as you're looking back, what would you, what do you wish someone had, had kind of told you or helped you with? I would say that most of it's caught, not taught. It doesn't mean we don't teach our kids, but it's how we mm. live our lives. And so if you can be a wissy wig family, what you see is what you get, that you're not the, you're not different outside the front door and inside the front door, mm. um, that you are a genuine, authentic believer who struggles and makes mistakes and admits them. Um, and mm. that you create the kind of home that is a haven that your kids are wildly enthusiastic about coming home to, which means nurture, which means praying with your kids, which means all those things. I would say mm. some practical tips um, of things that we did well uh, is read to your kids. Just reading to them is such mm. an important thing. Have uh, Create a sacred place around your dinner table. We definitely um, pulled back the reins of activity to preserve the family dinner table. Mm. And so we had dinner together all the time. It was part of my scheme to keep my kids coming back home as mm. good food. I would feed them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, have a place in your home that records prayer requests and answers in a physical location. So we, mm. when our kids were your kids' age, we had a, a giant chalkboard in our dining room and it just had three columns, the date, the prayer request, and the date that it was answered. And we mm. just wrote on with chalk what, what we prayed that. for. And the kids, our kids could physically see when God was showing up and doing things wow. in our midst. And, you know, sometimes we talk about it, but we forget about it. But so seeing it visually like that, I think is right. profound. That's a, a George Mueller prayer ledger right there, but inviting yeah, your family into it the is. whole thing. Wow. Yeah, but on a chalkboard. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or a whiteboard. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. I love that. My goodness. You know, um, <clears throat> obviously everybody should pick up this book, no matter if you are experiencing um, you know, a wayward adult child or, or not. I think this is something that's so profound, but I also want people to uh, tune into, you were telling me about the podcast that you do, um, which is amazing because as we talk about this motif of prayer and how important it is in our lives, and I think all of us would agree, we'd probably all say, you know what? I don't pray as much as I feel like I should, right? I, I'm not sure if very many of us who are listening to this would be like, yep, I'm knocking it out of the park right when it enough. comes to the prayer department. This is amazing. I'm doing great. Right. But, um, your podcast is something that could really aid people in this as well. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So talking about caught, not taught, it's modeled in it. It's called pray every day. It's been going on almost four years and it's a very simple formula, five minutes long. I I'm reading through the Bible right now. We're in the book of Deuteronomy. I go, um, chapter by chapter. So I read a chapter mm. And then according to whatever is in that chapter, I pray for you. And uh, my heart in starting the podcast has been to reach the world. And it's in lots of countries now around the world. Wow. And um, it's trending in Finland. So that's cool. Um, wow. That's <laughs> anyway, awesome. Not in the U.S., but I'm really big. In <laughs> trending in Finnish Finland. Yeah, circles, no, that's so. awesome. Um, <clears throat> but, uh. but yeah, so one of the things I think is really important to learn how to do is when you're reading your Bible to pray according to what you've read, praying scripture. Mm. It's if you don't know what to pray, that's the most profound thing to pray because it's the word right. of God, you know, it's right in line with God's will. And so mm. I will, if you just listen to it a few times, 
you will begin to be trained in that beautiful exercise as well. And you'll find that the word of God has something to say to you about everything. So it's been a real joy to do that podcast. Man, Mary, this has been such a joy to have this conversation. It's been challenging, convicting, inspiring. I mean, all of the above. I just heard a pastor this past weekend talk about praying for your kids. Um, And he talked about praying the fear of the Lord, praying for the favor of the Lord, and praying for their friends. It's like three very easy F's, just as pastors do, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Three F's in a poem at the end. um, But, (laughs) you know, (laughs) that was, yeah, that was so accessible for me. And so I feel like that coupled with this conversation, I think the Lord is trying to communicate something to me right now. But I know that not just me, he is also communicating so much, so much hope and healing into everybody who's listening to this right now. So thanks so much for spending time with us, joining us on on this episode. I want to make sure everybody, we'll put this in the show notes, we'll put it on the this episode page, but I want to make sure everybody picks up a copy of this book that just released. Congratulations, Mary. Love, Pray, Thank Listen, you. Parenting Your Wayward Adult Kids with Joy. And uh, we're really excited for you and, and excited for this work because this is definitely a felt need um, in so much of our, our Christian community. So thank you for spending time with us. Thanks. I do have a little freebie for your listeners. If, oh, please if do. Wanted. Yes. Yeah. Yes, so they absolutely. Can go to we love freebies. Mary Demuth, marydemuth.com slash LPL, which stands for Love, Pray, Listen, and you will receive okay. a year's worth of weekly prayers for your kids where you can just, they have blanks in them. So you can put their yeah. name in there. Ooh. And, um, these are important prayers that you can pray and they do talk about that. their friendships and they do talk about their decisions and all of that. So if you want 52 weekly prayers for free, Mary slash LPL. Wow. I love that, Mary. We're going to put that in the show notes too, that link. So you guys can access it really easily. Um, Mary, thank you so much. This has just been a blessing. We appreciate you and appreciate what the, your voice in, in this space. Thank you. It's been a great conversation. Thanks for asking great questions. Hey friend, if you liked this episode, be sure to like and subscribe so that you can stay in the loop every time Nothing Is Wasted releases a piece of content here on this YouTube channel. 